we've been refining this as we go along, okay? trying to make it more and more relevant to you clinically. And that's our hope is really that this is something where it's, we're preparing you clinically to use this for the rest of your career, but also making sure that it makes sense to you here in medical school, okay? So that's the goal. And there's a lot of ways we're gonna do this, all right? So we're gonna work our way from anatomy all the way to thinking about outcomes for patients, okay? And really, there's a lot of things ultrasound can do. So we can do what we call correlative or relative anatomy, knowing how structures are related to each other in living people, okay? You're gonna start cadaver lab. You're gonna dissect cadavers. You're gonna become very good at dissecting cadavers. And then you will never use that skill again in your entire <laughs> lives, unless you go into pathology. It's, a, it's not a helpful skill to be able to dissect a cadaver because you just never have to deal with cadavers again, right? But if I tell you how to look at people's anatomy in real humans and how their anatomy is re related to other parts of their body, right? how their arteries and veins are related in a real person by ultrasound, that's something you can use for the rest of your life. And it is important. We're also gonna talk about looking at physiology in action. So you're gonna spend a lot of time in the first two years learning about your physiology, the physiology of the heart. But physiology on paper is a lot less exciting than looking at a heart actually by ultrasound. So we're gonna look at physiology in action, okay? And then we're gonna think about what do we actually do clinically as physicians? Why are we teaching you all this stuff? Well, ultimately the goal is as physicians is when a sick patient comes to you and says, my stomach hurts, that you can generate a list of potential problems that are causing that. Okay? Almost never in medicine will they come in and say, this is my problem, and you say, oh, well, this is definitely what you have. Okay? It's almost never the case. Now, in emergency medicine, I have that benefit a couple times. So if someone comes in and they've just got a gunshot wound to the chest, I'm pretty sure the problem is a gunshot wound to the chest. <laughs> but that, that's a rarity. Okay, most of the time they come in with non-specific complaints and I have to develop what's called a differential diagnosis. Okay? That's a list of potential things that could be wrong with them. And then I have to figure out how do I prioritize that differential diagnosis. Well, ultrasound is really helpful okay? because I can do things. I can put it, an ultrasound probe on their heart or on their liver or on their gallbladder and it can tell me a little bit more about what's going on with the patient and I can refine my differential di diagnosis based on that. Ultimately, the hope is to make you guys better doctors. By Having all these skills and developing them over four years of medical school, you're going to be better physicians, okay? Even if you never use ultrasound in clinical practice after this, learn, knowing how ultrasound can help you change your differential diagnosis and look at physiology is going to make you better physicians in the long run. We also want to make you better students, okay? So it's not just about the long-term goal, it's about the short-term goal. And the way that we were trying to do that is to use ultrasound that targets the things you're learning. So in first year, you guys spend a lot of time learning anatomy. So we're really gonna focus ultrasound training around anatomy during our first year. And I'll talking a little bit about anatomy and how that relates to the physical diagnosis skills you're learning in PD, okay? And then second year, we go into more pathology. And then third and fourth year, we start looking at how do you actually use this in a clinical setting, all right? So as you gain more skills as a physician, the ultrasound will kind of grow with you. Okay, and that's our hope. Ultimately, if you decide to go on and use ultrasound as a clinician in residency or in practice, you're gonna have all these fundamental skills already in place and you're gonna be able to hit the ground running. If you decide never to use ultrasound again, you go into pathology and you never need ultrasound, that's fine because ultimately this is gonna help you be better at medical school even if you never use it clinically. Okay, so it's both a way to make you better physicians but also just kind of help you with your studies in the next four years. The goal for this lab is really threefold, okay? So one is knobology, actually just using the ultrasound machine, knowing how to turn it on, how to push the power button, how to change the probes and do the basic things. If you can't interface with the machine, it gets really frustrating, okay? If you think about teaching your parents or your grandparents how to use a tablet or a phone or something like that, and they're just smashing buttons and they're like, I don't understand this thing. That's what it's like to learn an ultrasound machine for the first time. But if you get comfortable pushing the buttons, you'll be comfortable using the machine. Right? You walk into a clinic, you've never seen their ultrasound machine before. If you know the four buttons that you have to push, how to turn it on, how to change the gain, how to change the depth, you will be able to ultrasound someone in almost any machine in any part of the world. Okay? And then we're gonna start talking a little bit about relational anatomy and what that means for you and then seeing a little bit of physiology in action. Okay? So those are our three goals for this lab today. Before we get into that too much, we have to kind of set the stage for what ultrasound is. Okay? So ultrasound is a medical imaging technology. The other medical imaging technologies you'll be exposed to that you're used to are CT scans, MRIs, and x-rays. The reason ultrasound is different 
is because we're not dealing with radiation or mag or magnetic resonance imaging. We're dealing with sound waves, okay? <laughs> so sound waves are produced by the ultrasound probe, okay? The ultrasound probe sends out sound waves and then it receives the sound waves, okay? And it's the change in frequency that occurs when the sound waves hit something and then get reflected back to the probe that creates the image on the screen. Most of the heavy lifting in these machines is done by the ultrasound probe itself, okay? So these are the expensive parts. These are the parts that get dropped the most. So just be really careful about that. The rest of it, the screen is really just something that interprets the data that's generated by the probe, okay? And again, this is all has to do with sound waves and particularly sound waves through tissue, okay? So you can, you can produce sound waves that penetrate really well through ground. So ground penetrating radar is sound waves. You can create sound waves that go really well through air. Ultrasound are sound waves that specifically are generated to go well through tissue, okay? Specifically through fluid, okay? The way the ultrasound is programmed is to transmit sound beams really well through fluid. The closer it is to the density of water, the better the ultrasound waves are transmitted, okay? The farther away the density is from water, the more the ultrasound waves are reflected, okay? So if you think about things that are really far for away from the density of water, air, bone, okay? Which are the two kind of extremes in the body, okay? Both air and bone reflect ultrasound beams. Even though they're vastly different densities, because they're far away from the density of water, they both create very bright reflections, okay? Water transmits the beam really well. Now remember, the machine has to get some reflection. If everything gets transmitted, the machine gets no information back. So every time the beam hits a tissue of any density, it's gonna reflect some of them. Just the, the amount of reflection versus refraction is really what determines how black or gray the image or white the image appears. Does that make sense to everyone? If you think about looking in a window where the sun's shining into the window, where you can see a little bit through the window, but you can also see your own reflection in the window, it's kind of what ultrasound's doing, okay? So all of these different structures have different fluid densities, okay? So skin, muscle, blood vessels, all have different fluid densities. The closer the density is to fluid, the blacker it appears. The farther away it is, the brighter it appears. So bone, air are kind of the reflectors. They, we often say they're the enemies of ultrasound because they reflect so much of the sound wave back to us, we can't see anything behind them. And then we like fluid because we can see through fluid. So here's an example, okay? Anyone know what this is? Something with black. All right, so fl what black on ultrasound is what? Fluid. I, if you don't remember anything else from today, black on ultrasound is fluid, okay? So if there's fluid, so we know there's fluid. This is a gallbladder, okay? I wasn't, ex you don't need to know that yet. But if I tell you this is a gallbladder and there's fluid in it, that fluid must be bile, okay? Because that's the kind of fluid that's in the gallbladder. And then we have these really bright things, okay? These are gallstones, right? They're really bright because they reflect all the ultrasound beams. In fact, they reflect so many ultrasound beams that they create these shadows because none of the sound waves get through this. So all the sound waves get reflected and none get transmitted. As opposed to here, you get most of the sound waves are transmitted because there's no bright reflection there. All right, let's look at another example. So here's another example. This is an ultrasound of an arm. You guys are gonna do a little bit of this today. So these, those are black, so what's, what are these? Fluid. fluid, awesome. All right, so we can figure everything out. So black fluid, circles in the arm. What do you think has fluid that's circular in the arm? Blood vessels, all right, so those are blood vessels. Artery, vein, we'll talk about how you tell the difference, but blood vessels. All right, here's a really bright reflector. What do you think that really bright reflector is? Bone, okay, so what bone do you think that would be if we're humerus? Okay, so here's humerus. So we've got blood vessels, we've got humerus. What do you think this intermediate density tissue is here? Muscle, okay. Muscle has lots of blood flow in it, so it's pretty vascular, so that's why it's pretty dark. And then you have less vascular bright. Now it doesn't have these strong reflections because you can see through it. So what do you think the bright areas are that are kind of surrounding and encapsulating the muscle? Fascia, right? Fascia doesn't have much blood vessels, so it's pretty bright. Not as bright as bone. Does that make sense to everyone? See how this works? It's easy. All right. What's this? Baby. Okay, baby in the uterus. Awesome. So, baby in the uterus. What's all? What? What's this? Amniotic fluid. Fluid, right? Fluid. Fluid is black, right? What kind of fluid? Well, it's a baby, so therefore the fluid in the uterus is amniotic fluid. So see how you. If I just asked you, if I gave you nothing else other than just showed you black fluid, you have no idea. But now that you know relationships, right, there's 
you know a little bit more information, you can say what kind of fluid that is, all right? All right, what's this? So this is in the uterus, sitting up here. Placenta, right? So placenta here, lots of blood vessels in the placenta, so dark, but not as dark as the fluid, right? What do you think this little fluid-filled blob in the chest is? Heart, right? Full of blood, okay? What else? So what is, what do you think these are right here? Above the heart, in the chest, lungs. But we said air reflects the ultrasound beam. So why isn't this reflecting the ultrasound beam? Yeah, there's no air in the lungs yet, right? This is a fetus. Fetus, they, you don't have air in, a, in fetal lungs. It's fluid in the fetal lungs right now. So they're dark because there's still fluid. What do you think all of these are back here? Spine, spine, and then what else? in the chest wall that are reflecting? Ribs, yeah, so ribs, there's our bones, bright shadow, and then the spine behind it reflecting, right? So see how that works? Dark, bright, and you can kind of figure out what's going on in the image just by knowing how bright or dark the image is, okay? All fluid is black by ultrasound, okay? Which means you have to use your clinical knowledge to figure out what kind of fluid it is. So this is water, that's blood and a blood vessel, this is fluid in the cyst, okay? They all look the same. They all look just as black. Telling the difference requires using your brain, okay? So the more you learn about pathology, the more you can say, well, if I know where something is and I know it's filled with fluid, the more I can guess about what kind of fluid that might be, all right? It's hard at the beginning of medical school. It gets easier and easier as you go along, all right? So for your purposes, just realize that all fluid is black. And then telling what kind of fluid it is is gonna de depend on what pathology and anatomy the patient has. Right. Cool. There are lots of different probes, okay? And we have different probes because they help us image different patients or different patients' anatomy. Don't worry too much about that at this moment. Just be aware that there are different types of probes. Shelly and Becky are pretty good about putting the probe you need for the exam you're doing on the machine, okay? But just be aware there are different types of probes. Um, and really, again, the selection of what probe is really just depends on what you're imaging. When you're holding the probe, okay, the tendency, because there's gel on the end of the probe, right, why do we need gel? Yeah, what would get in between, if I don't air. put gel, air, right? So we don't like air, air is one of our enemies. It would just reflect all the beams. So I need a little bit coupling gel so that I can actually see what I'm doing, okay? The problem is the gel is really slippery. So if I hold the probe really far away, I start slipping all over the place, okay? If I have a death grip on the probe, the same thing, too much pressure, I'm slipping all over the place. So pencil grip on the probe, and then you can stabilize the probe with your two fingers and then ultrasound. And it's much easier than trying to kind of scan like this, all right? I promise you, some of you guys today are gonna try to scan that. They're really fun. <laughs> you, know, get, you have to kind of get up and close and personal a little bit and really have a more of a pencil grip on the probe. That keeps the probe from sliding all over on the scan, okay? That seems silly, but learning how to hold the probe and move the probe is half the battle in ultrasound, okay? So we want you to figure that out. We could come and put our hand on your hand and get you the images you want in 30 seconds, but you wouldn't learn ultrasound. You would just learn how to stare at a screen, okay? That's not helpful to anyone, okay? So we want you struggling a little bit with how to get the images, okay? The other thing we're gonna talk a little bit about as we go through lab is image orientation, okay? What that means is the things on the left side of the screen should be on the right side of the patient, okay? That sounds confusing, it will make sense, okay? Because as you're ultrasounding someone, I wanna be able to know if I see something on this side of the screen, what side of the patient is it on, okay? Which side of the kidney is this? Which side of the kidney is this? And in order to do that in radiology, we need standard measurement and standard ways we hold the probe. So by convention, this little marker, you can see the marker here, and every probe has a marker like that. That marker, when you're ultrasounding someone, should be facing the patient's right or facing their head, okay? That means that the image on the screen is always gonna look the same, okay? If you're constantly flipping the probe like this, the, the screen is constantly doing somersaults and you're never, your brain's never gonna make sense of the images, okay? The ultrasound beam comes straight down the probe. So if I hold the probe up like this, you can see how the image is created by imaging straight down, all right? So orient the probe always towards the right or towards the head. There are a lot of buttons on these ultrasound machines. It can feel intimidating, but again, this learning the ultrasound machine is part of the process. Really, for our purposes, the depth and gain buttons are the ones we care about, okay? So these two buttons, 
okay? And you'll learn a couple of these other buttons just to record, but really the death and gain buttons are the ones we care about, right? Because what's the problem if you do this? There's too much gain. What can you see? Nothing, right? It's just really bright. You can't see any of the image. Not enough gain. You just can't see anything. So you want to be able to optimize your gain. If it looks too bright, turn down the gain. If it looks too dark, turn up the gain a little bit, okay? And then the problem with depth is if you're looking at something that's deep, that's past the end of your screen, you're not going to ever see it. So if I'm looking for something that's hidden down here, but I cut off the image here, I'm never going to find it. If I'm trying to look at an aorta that's way up here, but I'm trying to image all the way down here, then I lose a lot of detail. Okay? So optimizing the depth so that the structure you care about is kind of in the middle of the screen. All right? That seems silly, but again, as you guys are doing this, when you're looking for the brachial artery, you're going to have depth way down here, and you're going to be looking for a brachial artery that's way up here. But if you decrease the depth, it'll be much easier to find it. Okay? So de depth and gain are really the only two buttons we want you to push. Let's talk quickly about relative anatomy, okay? And why that's important. Does anyone have any idea what this is? And if you don't, that's fine. Because we're gonna walk through it. What's one thing you know on the screen? Fluid, awesome, that's it. That's all you care about, all right. So fluid, it's black. So there's something with fluid in it. They're round. Okay. What if I tell you something else? So here, I'm going to tell you we're looking at the neck, and this is the trachea. Okay. Here's trachea. What the glands that's right above the trachea, around your neck? Thyroid. thyroid. Okay, so thyroid. So there's that's trachea. Therefore, that must be thyroid. Okay. What's lateral to the thyroid that has lots of fluid running through it? Carotid artery and jugular vein. So carotid artery, jugular vein. See how that works? This is relative anatomy in a real live person. We can know one structure and then we can figure out what everything else is, okay? The more anatomy you learn, the better you'll be at this and the easier it'll get. Does that make sense to everyone? Telling the difference is what you get to do in lab today a little bit, all right? Telling the difference between the jugular vein up top, carotid artery below. Why is that important? So Dr. Lyon, who's my partner, who you'll see a lot of, is now training some of our residents and faculty right now doing central lines. That's putting big blood, big catheters in central vessels. Particularly the jugular vein is often we use the jugular vein, right? So you get this huge big needle and you stab it into someone's neck and you put a catheter in their jugular vein, right? That can save lives. If you put a big catheter in their carotid artery and stab their neck with a big needle, that actually can be really life-threatening. So being able to know the difference between the vein and the artery is really medically important, okay? Because you want a catheter in that one, you never really want to put a catheter in that one. All right. So that's relative anatomy. That's how we know how things are related. What about physiology and action? So I said physiology and action. We're saying maybe this case, right? Morbidly obese patient, patient who's hypertensive. And I said, their blood pressure is really high. You have to take a manual blood pressure. You all did that in PD, right? Easy, hard? Not too bad. Yeah, not too bad, right? It took some practice. So what were you doing? So in PD, you were inflating the blood pressure cuff, occluding the artery, and then what are you, what are you listening for? Turbulent flow. Turbulent flow, okay? So that's, you know, so your normal flow in the, in the artery is what kind of flow? Laminar. Laminar. And if you put your stethoscope over your artery right now, what would you hear? Nothing. Nothing. So you're creating turbulent flow, right? That turbulent flow starts when the pressure in the artery just starts to equal the pressure in the cuff, right? So you're letting the pressure down in the cuff until it equals the artery. And then when the pressure, when the art the pressure in the artery completely overcomes the pressure in the cuff, that's when you lose turbulent flow. Right? So that's what a manual blood pressure cuff does. Anyone know how an automated automated blood pressure cuff works? Yeah. Alright, pretty similar concepts, right? This is just the case where the and the reason I say this is because 90% of the things, and just like the case I gave you, right? Most of the time, you're you almost every clinic and every ED and every you know, every hospital bed is using automated blood pressure cuffs. And then when they don't believe the reading, then they send a medical student and they say, give me a manual blood pressure. And like, oh, I haven't done a man manual blood pressure in months. An automated blood pressure cuff is inflates the cuff, compresses the artery. And as the, as the cuff deflates, the artery starts to open up and then it starts to pulsate. And as it pulses, it creates vibrations. And this little sensor senses the vibration. So when it just starts pulsating, that is sensing systole. And then when it completely stops, that's diastolic pressure. All right. Now there's a couple assumptions we make here. One, the primary assumption we make is that the artery is sitting right below the cuff. We're going to talk a little bit about why that might be a problem. 
So I'm going to start relative anatomy, okay? So what's this in my in two minutes? Trachea, good. There's my artery. All right, what's this? What's this? Right, just lateral to trachea. Thyroid, okay. And then lateral to thyroid. Carotid artery. artery, okay. Everyone see how that works? So when you guys are scanning each other, don't try to find the vessels. Start midline trachea, thyroid, carotid artery. Now what's the problem? What am I missing? Jug your vein. Where is it? Collapse. Why is it collapse? I'm pushing a little bit, so low pressure, right? So if I let off the pressure a little bit, <laughs> right? So you guys have a death grip and you're choking <laughs> your partner to death with the probe, you're not gonna see it. What's the other problem? What else am I doing that's causing a problem? I'm talking, what else? I'm standing up. Why, why is that a problem? Gravity, right? So all the, the, the vein is supposed to drain blood from my brain to my heart. But I'm, gravity is doing all the work right now, okay? So the vein doesn't have to be dilated because gravity is just, all the blood's just draining. So when you're scanning each other, don't have your partner sit up, have them lay flat, right? If they lay flat, guess what? Gravity is your friend. Does that make sense? Or you can have them standing on their head if they're really talented, <laughs> all right? So what else, so other than standing on my head or laying flat, what else could I do? If I'm holding the same amount of pressure, what else could I do to cause that vein to dilate. Tense up. What does that do? So why? So if I put, if I increase the pressure or resistance to venous return, what should my vein do? Dilate. So let's see. What so, <laughs> so just <laughs> increasing my, yeah, yeah, just increasing my, so if I increase my intrathoracic pressure, so I take a deep breath in and hold it, expands my lungs. My lungs put pressure on my SVC. My SVC creates things. And then I and then I tense my abdominal muscles, puts more pressure on my IVC. So if I increase resistance to venous return, my vein dilates. That's physiology in action. That is much cooler. I could tell you that and I could show you on a graph, but it's much cooler to see in person, right? The, your, your brain will remember this. So this is physiology in action and also relative anatomy, right? This is part of how when I'm putting a central line in, I put pressure on it and I make sure if it collapses, then I know that's where I put the, put the vessel. I also make sure I'm laying people flat. So I never put a central line with someone standing up because the vein's too small. So far so good? Makes sense. All right, let's do one more physiology in action. This relates back to the case. So why did I give you that case? Because it has nothing to do with this, right? Because he's hypertensive. All right, so he's hypertensive and he is morbidly obese. All right, so let's think about why that may or may not be true. So we're gonna scan his brachial artery. So we're going to use relative anatomy and what we know about pressure. So veins, low pressure, high pressure. Low pressure relative to arteries, right? So relative anatomy actually becomes harder when anatomy changes. So everyone's blood vessels in their arm are a little bit different. We're going to, if we're looking for an artery, what could we do to make that artery kind of stand out a little bit more? Taking consciousness. Taking consciousness, or what we can do is put pressure. So we're going to, I'm just going to compress. So we're going to just compress. And when we see something pulsing, you guys see that? Right in the middle of the screen. Okay. Everyone see that? Can everyone see that? There's the there's the artery, and I'm gonna push. Whoa, it's pulsing. Oh, it's pulsing. So what's what does an automatic blood pressure cuff do? So automatic blood pressure cuff pushes it up to then. Right, so now comes the, and then as it releases pressure, it senses that vibration. So if I had a pressure transducer on the end of this probe, the point where she can completely compress this artery is essentially the systolic pressure, right? That's the point where the pressure on the probe equals the pressure in the artery. Everyone with me so far? This is kind of what a blood pressure cuff does. Now, why did I give you this case, all right? So I'm gonna give you a little bit of extra soft tissue. <laughs> So you gained 350 pounds in the last five seconds, okay? So now, what happens? So we increase the soft tissue. All right, push, 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 keep going, keep going, all right. Harder, more, more, more. All right, there we go. Was that harder or easier? <laughs> Much harder. Much harder, okay. So a lot more pressure to compress the artery. Did his blood pressure change at all? Did his blood pressure reading change? 
Yeah. So what do you think? So if someone has a lot more soft tissue between them and the, especially the automated cuff, but also the manual cuff, right? What happens? You, it creates, the cuff has to generate more pressure to compress the soft tissue, not the artery. So what do you think? People who are morbidly obese, do you think if, if we said 90% of people with morbid obesity also have high blood pressure? Do you think that's necessarily true? Not necessarily, right? There's reason to be skeptical because really what we're doing is saying 90% of people who are morbidly obese, it requires a lot more pressure to compress their soft tissue. Not necessarily their intra-arterial pressure is different. Does everyone get that? Does that make sense to everyone? Even worse if they are bodybuilders, right? That's a little muscle resist compression even more, right? Mm -hmm. So if you got these guys who have huge arms, they're, they're gonna have elevated blood pressure just because they, their muscles are resisting that more. Does that make sense? The more distance we create between our probe or our blood pressure cuff and the artery, the more you have to compress soft tissue before you're actually compressing the artery. Yeah. So there's a reason to be skeptical of when we see all these high blood pressure readings in morbidly obese patients. But that's hard to explain to you, but it's pretty easy to show you. So this is the power of ultrasound, right? You can do that. So if you think about it, so when you learned ultrasound or when you learned how to take a blood pressure in PD, what do they tell you? What do you have to do for a patient? So they sit down, relax their arm, right? So if you flex your arm, even if you're, you know, if you flex your arm and you, you create more resistance, guess what? Your blood pressure reading will go up. Now your blood pressure hasn't changed, but if you, if you contract your muscles, that's more resistance against the cuff, your blood pressure reading gets higher because it creates, it's more pressure to comp compress the artery. So now you understand why it's important how you take a blood pressure. Right. You get to see it in action, right? So this is the power of ultrasound.